This is A Geek Leader. Hey guys, welcome to episode 93 of A Geek Leader Podcast. And today on the show, we've got Halid Mashat, and he is a uh, serial entrepreneur. He's a tech um, speaker at many different events. And I heard his TEDx talk where he talked about future, uh, futuristic things and like kind of where technology is going in the future and how life is going to be in the future. And it, it just inspired me. I thought it was super interesting and super fascinating. And uh, because of all that, I got him on the show, so it's pretty awesome. I, um, actually, some fans reached out and suggested that I that I bring him up on the show, so um, that's where I first started researching and found out more about him. I connected with him. Uh, we had some good conversations, so I uh, thought he'd be a great guest, and he did not disappoint. The audio is a little bit low at certain points, um, partly because of some some uh, issues on my end when it comes to recording, but we got it all taken care of. I think you guys are really going to enjoy this show, um, so we're going to take it up, pick it up where um, Halid is talking about his uh, journey through technology and where he got started and uh, kind of some of the things he's doing today. So with that being said, give it up for Halid Mashat. Um, sure. So um, my history with technology started when I was about 13 years old. Um, I um, I started my first software um, that was, you know, I got bored with uh, biology and I tried to make it more fun uh, for me and other students. So that was what I did. Um, I made a soft, an interactive software. At the time, I think it was, it was with Visual Basic and Flash and some stuff. Very, very patchy, but it, um, it made you be able to, uh, or the students to be able to learn um by clicking seeing things move etc um and uh, the fact of the matter is after six months it got into uh, being one of the uh, most used software in the region um where i live um because i distributed it for free and it seemed to uh, enable students to uh, have more fun while studying biology so um, afterwards, um, just got stuck to me that the fact that I was able to uh, help so many uh, through through this tool, um, and um, I went on from there. Uh, I think uh, I coded about maybe ten software programs by the time I was eighteen, and, uh, and I just decided I would go into uh, technology and uh, I took my master's in engineering. Um, yeah. So, um, from do you think that you were um, excited it, because of technology, because of the things that you could do, or did it just kind of be one of those things that was just a just a hobby, and then you fell in love with it because of the work that you had to put into it? Um, I think it was because of what uh, it was enabling me to do. Um, obviously the, the thrill of problem solving was, uh, you know, was a plus for me. Um, and it was something that I obviously, um, you know, felt good at, but, um, uh, it was mostly because, um, you know, every, every single thing that I did, I, I didn't obviously code APIs or whatever. I just coded, um, software programs that were either educational or serving a certain purpose or a certain solution. So um, for me, it was mostly what I could do with it, what was an me to do, and then at the same time, how easy it was to spread um, as as a solution. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I get that. That's um, it, I th- for me, it was it was very similar in the fact that like you build something and then you can share it with lots of people really quickly, and you can kind yeah. of. Spread that idea faster than any kind of physical product or physical thing that you were putting together. Um, it, just the, the economies of scale for technology was just one of those things that I thought was really cool and fascinating uh, for me anyway when, when I got started uh, in doing that. Uh, one of the things that, that caught my attention in your bio um, was, was that you're a, um, a serial techpreneur. So you kind of uh, started and worked with many different companies and many different technologies. Can you talk a little bit about how you got started the first time? Like what was the first kind of company that you spun up or helped out with and started? Um, like- oh, sure. Uh, the first company that I started, I started out of school, uh, engineering school to be exact. Um, uh, obviously, the first, I don't know, maybe eight years of, of my life as a programmer, I was mostly 
uh, well, six, seven years actually. It, I, I was, I would just create the solution and give it out. And then I, I started seeing how to help people and help me as well. I was, you know, a student. Um, my parents were, you know, uh, public servants. So, um, you know, I needed to kind of meet and make ends meet on my own. And then, uh, if I wanted to get full cool gadgets to, to pay for them myself. So I had to, to kind of figure out a way to, um, you know, generate some, uh, you know, cash flow while uh, doing what I love, which was creating solutions for people. Um, so but with that, uh, during school, we had a, you know, the right for one project, uh, you know, per year. And I made my project my company. So the first software I built um, uh, in that purpose was SkillLearn, which is a peer-to-peer -peer learning platform um, that um, served for, I think, about in the first four months that we launched it, we had about 5,000 users. Um, and obviously, since I didn't really have any money, uh, so it was no marketing whatsoever. The platform, I developed it myself from scratch. Uh, uh, WordPress wasn't under, as much of a thing back then than it is now. Um, so um, I had to learn while coding. Um, it was very interesting and um, uh, it caught the eye of some, uh, some people. And, um, uh, you know, we got finance to develop a fuller version, a more future version. And then um, we started for the public and then we stopped it. And then we started it as a licensed platform for uh, large organizations that wanted to, um, you know, either train their own employees or universities that needed to use a blended learning tool that was mixed between live sessions, uh, sessions in presence and MOOC sessions. So that's kind of the low of differentiator that, that went into our platform, which is you build a curriculum that has all these different things and that are, you know, structured within the platform, everything from, uh, you know, uh, student or learner attendance to, um, you know, the live feature of webinars, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So um, what ended up happening with that company and that, that business? Uh, actually, um, since we started on the first, we solved about three licenses, I believe, of the platform. Every time we sold license, we have to um, edit the software in, in such case that, uh, you know, we change all the features, obviously, keep them the, the largest chunk of it uh, the same, uh, rebrand it, and have to, uh, to deliver it. And then that um, process, we, um, you know, it kind of felt more tedious than it needed to be. Um, and I thought maybe that the technology would catch up in a way that it would enable us to make it more seamlessly. Um, so I, I stopped a little bit the commercial work on that while I was working on another project, which was my second company. Um, obviously I got into more consulting work in, in the meantime. Uh, you know, I've got another school, I got married, so, uh, you know, I had to, for a bit more uh, cash flow, so we had we started, um, you know, a consulting firm uh, in technology that kind of, in the end, encompassed all the products that we uh, that we developed. And now it's uh, you know a group holding that has about five subsidiaries and in, in different um, types of technology. Nice, excellent. All right, so um, I know one of the things that you've kind of focused on, at least I've heard you talk about uh, when you gave a TEDx talk about kind of the future technology and kind of some of the future things that we're seeing. And um, that's always been fascinating to me, kind of where we're going in the future. And that's one of the reasons why I got into technology is because I wanted that, um, you know, science fiction was always, you know, uh, uh, I was always a fan of science fiction. It was always something that I was interested in. And I kind of see like things going and progressing in a way that, you know, my parents' generation and then my parents' parents. So when I look back, like how different life was a hundred years ago to where it is today and what's it going to be like for my kids and my kids' kids. And, um, 
what, what are some of your thoughts on, on kind of where we're going with technology and uh, artificial intelligence? And what do you see that as, as you know, because there's different people with different camps. You got the Elon Musk who's kind of afraid of it a little bit and thinks that, you know, yes, yeah, definitely coming, but we need to regulate it. We need to really um, put some boundaries around artificial intelligence. And there's other people that says, you know, general artificial intelligence is so far away. We just need to, like, continue to develop and continue to build. Kind of where do you sit in that ground? Um, I, I think, um, I mean, I'm not trying to take the easy road out here, but uh, I think I'm, I'm a little bit in the middle in the, in the fact that I know for a fact that we're still, you know, way behind on, um, you know, on anything nearly uh, close to singularity in matters of what artificial intelligence can make today. And the biggest, um, you know, the, the, the biggest kind of proof of that is how many people how many companies, how many governments got into, uh, you know, uh, autonomous vehicles, and we're still way behind in, on anything that would be autonomous for autonomous five on the scale. Um, so it's it's very difficult for me to see it in the near future that, you know, suddenly in ten years we'll have robots that can take care of themselves and that can think on their own. Um, I know that you know something like like Mr. You know, Singyaki University, one of, the, one of the founders, one of the people that say, yes, in five, ten years, uh, everything, uh, like, all of this is possible for me. It's, it's not really the case. Um, uh, but again, I know for a fact, again, that I was in China about maybe four or five months ago, and uh, uh, the, to see what collective um, uh, data collection and AI nurturing does um you know in, in, in that kind of environment and the social scale system uh, it's it's a pretty frightening thing ethics wise and um you know on where technology is is going or the application of it at least so uh i'm i'm, I'm, I'm not afraid of technology itself obviously i'm afraid of what uh you know people are doing with it um uh, in certain places around the world, and uh, uh, at the same time, I know that uh, you know with with what happened at CES a month ago, um, with uh, you know IBM pulling the the first independent quantum computer uh, that's stable enough for it to be purchased on on the open market, um, I think that will that will push us a bit forward. So in maybe two or three years, the the luster will get smaller, and then it's going to be a bit more affordable, uh, you know, for other companies to compete on it, and that will uh, push us leaps and bounds into into the future of what artificial intelligence, be it processing, uh, HPC, and all of these things. Um, so regulated, yes, it, we need to have uh, universal regulations around this. So it can be GDPR in Europe and. Other places are doing whatever they want. We, have, we need to have a little bit more, you know, boundaries around uh, what what. I mean, obviously, that's for different people. But we need to at least have certain ground rules. Yeah, no, I agree 100. percent You kind of see that today with um, you mentioned uh, policies in Europe, like with GDPR, and and it's kind of interesting how companies have to change the way they do certain aspects in certain areas to fit certain regulations. Whereas, you know, people are people everywhere and the data is the data everywhere. It doesn't matter where your data center really lives and physically lives anymore. That stuff, those rules are outdated and we need to kind of move our regulation along. And, you know, I don't know, it just, it's, it's really confusing right now, I guess, that the shift to, that, we're, that we're doing away from physical products to, to digital and, and how all that plays out. Yeah, and then you have, you know, these people that are saying that we, like, for our data, it's our data, and we need to be able to, you know, uh, personally sell it if we want to, and have a control over it in that in that way. Uh, I think this is a, a little bit far fetched in the sense that, uh, you know, the amount of data that's so like of any of us, especially people that live on uh, online and have, you know, uh, uh, branding whatever online. It's very difficult to ask, you know, now those companies to, to 
that give you back and new things back, so things to all that data. So uh, it's it's very difficult. People seem to, uh, to misunderstand what privacy means in this day and age. It's no longer, you know, you can no longer control most of what happens online. You know, obviously, you know about the dark web and the, you know that the the fact of that the internet you see is much much smaller than you know the full uh, size of, of data that, that there's out there and there are people right now um, creating in whatever way data of other people that are inconspicuous towards it so there's no more privacy unless you want to live outside of the grid um, and you need to kind of you know try to make your uh, private life obviously you know marital life whatever um, you know outside of that scope and just be happy that you don't have cameras in your house because maybe one day that will be the case uh we never know so yeah it's uh, it's a pretty complex dilemma i uh, <laughs> i can give you a this or that because uh, the speed it's evolving i can't believe in yeah, I think the privacy, it's, it's interesting because like I know when I talk to some people in my family that there's no clue about you know, where data is, what it's going. They have no clue about privacy because they're not in the technology world. They don't really care. They don't really have any understanding of what information is out there. And there's people like me who may be on the extreme to where, you know, I don't even have an Alexa in my house because I'm not exactly sure what the rules and laws are about any of that. So I'm not even, you know, going. I don't don't have one either uh just to, to show you you're not alone in that um if i can <laughs> if i can limit the points of entry of data in, in my surroundings especially in my home of course i would do that um i mean uh, I, I even you know i override my all my my devices here at home to disable um uh, cameras unless manually commanded to so i'm you know i'm pretty yeah. On, on the safe side, it's just that uh, exactly for people that have no, you know, connection to the software world and on uh, all of that, it's very difficult to, put, to, to, to train on them the, yes, you have to be worried about your, the privacy of your data. They, you know, they, they, there's no need for them to be, you know, frightened by all said media and whatever around, yes, there's your, your data are being exploited by exploited by by companies and whatever they're you know the the the, the it's not about responsibility even anymore it's just we know why companies do data to sell you more products at the end if you you know do not choose to buy that product or you're not a compulsive buyer then fine i you know, I could disable cookies and, and, and be aware of everything here on my browser, but I really don't do that because eh, uh, it's not really much of an annoyance for me. Uh, I you, you get used to it after a certain time, uh, and you understand that what they're trying to get is profit, and what the rules of profit are. If you don't, you know, get your hand into your wallet or your digital wallet. There's nothing to be afraid of, um, you know, in, in that sense. Yeah, I get it. There's, there's that balance between convenience and uh, and privacy that's out there. And, yeah. and I know for me, there's certain things where like, yeah, I'm completely fine with Google knowing my, my search patterns. I'm completely fine with, you know, um, Facebook pix pixels tracking me around from certain places and Amazon showing me ads from things that I shopped on earlier. I've yeah, gotten yeah. used to that and I'm okay with that, you know, yeah. but I don't want necessarily someone listening to the private conversations that I'm having with my family. Of course. Of course. That's why I don't have Alexa. I don't have Google home. Uh, yeah. I'm definitely with you on that. Uh, but exactly. I mean, for people that still are hang up on, okay. Um, uh, Facebook still has my pictures that I deleted. What does that change in the scheme of things i mean mm -hmm. <laughs> you posted those pictures obviously for you know uh, so it's, it's just it's just that it's just the making the difference between exactly between uh, you know privacy and convenience and right now you know for those type of things i'm happy with convenience because well it's convenience uh, and i tend to be a lazy person if i 
if I don't need to not be. <laughs> so what are some of the ways that you see um, kind of the advances with artificial intelligence and quantum computing helping uh, the population as a whole? What are some of the positives that are coming out of it when, you, when it comes to like smart cities and things like that and how it's helping um, you know, the, the world? I think, um, I think, you know, we have enough devices in the world to collect enough data for us to improve tremendously um, uh, on the state of what, what smart cities are. I believe that quantum computing will help um, diminishing the need for more hardware. I mean, obviously, there will be new hardware, there will be improved hardware, but, um, you know, it's not like you need uh, more infrastructure anymore. If you have hyper computing and quantum computing, that makes data aggregation a lot uh, more significant. And that gives you the, po the possibility to um, understand a lot more with a lot less, uh, you know, uh, environmental data, for example. Um, so uh, this is something that typically people don't go into, but, you know, just um, I just want to approach a, 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 a new thing that might maybe, you know, uh, the audience didn't uh, think about. Um, Hypercomputing will not only allow us to process or uh, the quantum computing to process more data and less time and be more efficient and then have more, um, you know, observatory connections, et cetera, et cetera, but it will make us need less um, devices, less infrastructure, you know, infrastructure, um, uh, just think of the number of servers that we need to stock information while it's being treated um, to congregate. Imagine if all of that data can go into a silo of, you know, I don't know, if, if, if we uh, process uh, maybe a two or three gigs in five minutes, imagine that you can do it in one second. You would need a lot less buffer size. And then all these, you know, uh, all this data that we're collecting will no longer need to have that in that much space. So our energy consumption will go low, obviously, if the data centers are, um, you know, are getting less and less uh, need from a storage perspective, um, that we can focus on the applications less more than we focus on the infrastructure and that our investments would go more into the solution rather than uh, what every infrastructure needs. And I think for countries that don't have that much cash flow or GDP to invest into infrastructure, that might be a game changer in that aspect. Um, uh, I think this, this is at least one of the uh, you know, places where, I, where, where my reflection goes. The second would be um, fighting, you know, global crisis like epidemics. Um, the faster you catch it, the faster you can react and the faster you can prevent. Um, and uh, quantum computing will enable us to uh, react much faster to any sensory data, any uh, and, and digitalization of um, uh, patient record would help us also, uh, you know, do uh, fast treatments, understand much better the patterns and in much, you know, faster way. So um, I think uh, people should, you know, should change a little bit the the way of thinking about smart cities from these cities where everything is gadgetized and everything is electronic and think about the fact that if we compute much better we will need actually less gadgets and the, everything will be happening uh, computational wise yeah so have you heard of crispr uh, yes yeah the, the genetic uh, modification uh, i guess so i was thinking and um this is where my mind goes sometimes i was listening to a, a different podcast and they were talking about crispr and i started thinking i was like what if we had like the ability to rapidly process like DNA patterns that we've never even, you know, and, and the results of like what would happen if we did certain things, like like think, think about using a quantum computer and you could say, well, what would happen if we took this gene out 
from, you know, let's say we took malaria away from mosquitoes. What are all the possibilities that could possibly happen? And we could run all that through a quantum computer and know whether we should or should not do something like that. If it's best for mankind or, or, you know, detrimental in the long run. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I would love for that to happen at least in the last five to 10 years because, um, you know, fauna and flora wise, we're going pretty much into other species extinction. So, um, I mean, we need to, for, for that to happen a lot faster. So I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful, um, you know, in the uh, gene analysis department. Um, uh, but yes, I think, I think it goes back to the ground rule. Um, who decides whether we should or we should not uh, do that modification, right? Um, right. And since the scientists, uh, you know, will will get those possibilities uh, with the gene se- sequencing and uh, the fact that they will, you know, with with uh, quantum computers, they're already doing it, which is a more, um, you know, a deep or a deeper study of the, you know, the animal genome and human genomes um, that will. You know, all the things that you see, as you said, in um, uh, what you call them, uh, sci-fi uh, yeah. movie series about, you know, making uh, uh, emotionless soldiers and, mm-hmm. and all these things. And actually, experimentation went into those things. And, um, I mean, it's not even secret anymore that, um, you know, trying to... Um, change behavioral patterns with drugs and, and all these sort of things. I think that um, the issue with science and technology, especially when, when you go into research, is um, what happens when there is no observation? What happens, I mean, uh, you know, where uh, I, was a, I, I was a white hat hacker at some point, and, you know, you you get tempted to just explore. The scientist's mind is a big, you know, well of curiosity. Mm-hmm. And it's very difficult to, can, to, you know, to contain once you see the possibility of it going into something bigger. And that's the plot of most disastrous sci-fi movies, right? Um, somebody did an experimentation thinking that it w- it's for the good of mankind in a way of And why is, are those fat patterns so repeated? It's because it's, it would probably be the case. So um, as I am hopeful for it to be positive for mankind, uh, to be honest, it's uh, the, the kind of applications that would advance some agendas make me a little bit fearful in that, in that aspect. Yeah, definitely, uh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I see it as being like the next steroid or something like that, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the thing. I I don't think uh, the next you know world world you know world war would be uh, would be with with you know nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons are still you know old uh, thoughts. I think it would be much more cyber warfare and genetic biological. Warfare. Because, um, you know, that's where science has taken us. It's taken us into the micro, it's taken us into the nano, it's taken us into the precise. And uh, I think that's that's where we are going, uh, you know, if we're looking at the, the dark side of the universe. Hmm. No, I agree with you 100%. I definitely think it's, it's going more cyber. And it's just because it's easier it's faster and you can really make a big impact um, without with, with less risk on your side, you know, whereas, um, um, yeah, sending troops into things like that, there's a lot of risk there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so when it comes down to, uh, comes down to some of that, uh, I guess we keep going out into the dark side of, <laughs> of world wars and things like that. And uh, what are some of the positive things that, that you see coming out of this stuff that, um, um, you, you know, I, honestly, when you look at the dark side, you look at, I, I think a cyber 
a, a world war of cyber would be more positive than I you know, want a biological life. Um, yeah. Even though there's still, you know, it's, it's not good either way, but it's still um, better than the alternative of nuclear and such like that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, to be honest, for me, it's like when I try to see the positive you know, side of it, I would think, um, as, you know, obviously as a species, we would evolve, uh, you know, either through you know, genetic modification or, uh, you know, through natural processes. Uh, and we would be able to, I think one of the best things I'm thinking about is um, repopulating um, a fauna through, uh, you know, genome sequencing and uh, cloning. Mm. I think, you know, uh, I, I would love to, you know, creating uh, or recreating uh, species from DNA is, um, uh, something that I really want because I don't want obviously to you know all these systems to, uh, to disappear by the time I you know my kids grow up um, and so you know to preserve but it's no longer a you know a spot to preserve the earth as it is we already back a pretty huge damage on it so uh, my thought into you know all this genetic and bio advancements and coupled with the quantum computing is, um, you know, as you said, to, to calculate the possibility of cloning to go wrong and to pick up the best option in, in modification and analysis to be to enable the recreation of the fauna flora ecosystem. I think this this is one of the like biggest things that I wish would happen through uh, technology advancement. Um, Obviously, uh, you know, thinking of world hunger, the fact that, you know, creating, uh, I talk about it in my TEDx, you know, the stem cell state uh, thing, uh, where you don't have to, you know, kill animals to get your, your you know, your lunch stick. Mm -hmm. And for it to be either printed or um, stem cell engineered, uh, I think that's also something that I look forward to. Uh, I, I know for obvious reasons that will, you know, if, if the climate change continues on the path that it is, people will be less, less inclined to go out during the day, mm -hmm. which will push us into a more, um, you know, um, AR, VR based work, you know, environment. Uh, I, I, I don't, Thing that I don't think of that as a positive or a negative thing. Obviously, you know, to each their own uh, thinking about that. But I think it's coming. Uh, you know, you already see it in in, uh, in the Middle East where there is, you have to work. You know, either night shifts or evening shifts, uh, or when they go to the office, stay in the office all day so the heat goes because of of global warming. So for me, it's something that that is happening people would think on convenience obviously so working from home is pretty convenient. Um, uh, so let yeah, me, let well, me get, into, get into that uh, you know kind of the, the idea of taking stem cells and, and using that to grow meat or, or some type of food that would be um, you know more humane uh, and, and such like that and I know there's a lot of companies working on stuff like that right now. Um, do you think that'll lead into like a market of kind of having like a designer uh, of, of, of meat if, where you have like some exotic meat that you would never have today that you could just grow and kind of. Um... I think so. And, you know, I, I went to the most basic you know, choice when I, on my TEDx, which was, uh, you know, to choose the number of calories you would have in, in a steak, you know, or right. the, the percentage of fat or whatever. Um, but obviously, yes, um, I think that was, I mean, pretty much today, um, you know, yes, people look for the, the finest and things, but the majority, the 99% of people really don't, don't seem, you know, much of a difference, at least, you know, I, I know in, in the African continent, uh, 
uh, people are not really looking for you know Kobe stick uh, because mm -hmm. they don't know what it is, right? So uh, I, I think mostly would be adapting to to diet to you know uh, health conditions that would prevent them from eating that stick because you have diabetes, you have cholesterol, if you have whatever. So I think that, that would be what what the focus would be on. And today, um, uh, obviously, the focus would be on that after texture and taste, because that's what where companies are struggling today. It's to recreate fully the, the texture and the, the, the taste of said steaks. But obviously, it would be a great market for very exotic meats. Um, uh, uh, crossbred meats, which oh, would yeah. be very different from, from you know, you, there are a lot of species that you can't crossbred, obviously, for, for obvious reason, you have a chicken with, <laughs> with a cow. <laughs> but, yeah, you can also, um, I mean, uh, digging into, like, you could take your genetic, um, you know, your, your DNA, and your computer can say, hey, based on your genetics, this is the kind of meat that you should eat that would be healthiest for you you know the right portions yep. of, of everything and um it's, yeah it'd be awesome it's exactly what uh, what what uh, you know what ion would would say <laughs> <laughs> which was exactly you know i yeah i want to see steak in the morning so i'll do my health checkup and then that so i would know how you know what my steak i think it would be like as i said uh, for again, for convenience, it, it, the, the destruction of said food will be in our house, homes. It won't mm -hmm. even be delivered anymore. Uh, you would have maybe once a month the ingredients delivered uh, for for all sorts of things, and then you know everything would be printed in in, in your own home. So I, uh, I mean, obviously this is this is throwing pretty far in the future, but since, you know, I, I, I do not dismiss things where we are working currently on. I know a lot of companies are working on, on stem cell, uh, you know, food-based, um, and I know that maybe, what, uh, two, three years ago, what government summit in Dubai, uh, and we had already a taste of, you know, uh, molecularly structured food. Uh, it, wow. Obviously, yeah, it's it's not that far, and uh, uh, you know it, it will create a whole like the whole new understanding of a food. Uh, and uh, obviously, this kind of takes my mind off to um, jobs. You know, uh, now today we're thinking uh, people will be losing jobs because of technology, and I'm thinking, uh, who's gonna uh, you know, do the selection of what kind of meat and study with, like, which kind of meat would taste best now that we can, we are able to create it from scratch. Um, so what that job would be called? We still don't have anything that would be called that, right? So, you know, I, I, I was on this national TV, uh, you know, show and then they, they brought me to, um, uh, calm people. That are freaking out about robots are, you know, going to do a revolution and overthrow us, and uh, that we want we'll be all out of jobs and that our governments won't pay universal income and whatever, whatever. Um, I think we're still, you know, far behind on the on that thought uh, because exactly. Um, We'll have by in ten years sixty percent of the jobs that we know, you know, will be replaced by others. Uh, it doesn't mean that they, will, you know, that they will disappear, or that they, we will be obsolete. Because we're human. It's not that we're obsolete. It's that sometimes we're lazy to learn other things. So I think the what what people should focus on is to learn how to, you know, evolve in their learning pattern. And um, there will be obviously less used for technical skills and more used for creative, more used for, uh, you know, uh, the, I would say uh, 
decision making, uh, creative research kind of uh, environments. But other than that, I don't think you know, humanity evolved through three industrial revolutions, and this is a fourth, mm -hmm. right? So it won't be different. People that used to pull carts because cars didn't exist, well, they found other jobs and their children found other, you know, uh, jobs to do. So yes, the speed is is much faster, and that's why we need to learn to adapt much faster. But it it won't be much of a problem for you know we we see already millennials are changing careers every nine months. That's you know. That's the, the the second below median of what what you know what today's millennials are you know the rate of which which they're changing careers. It's nine to twelve months. They change careers every year. So I think it's just the older generation uh, that's you know that has that one job for forty years kind of type of mentality that is afraid for their children, but the children themselves themselves are fine. They're not worried because they're already in a very fast-paced changing environment. No, I think you're absolutely right. I think there's, <clears throat> at least at this time, there's little to fear. And um, I always tell people, I was like, well, look back to, you know, being in the United States and thinking back of when we had the, the revolution back in the 1700s, most people were, um, you know, blacksmiths or they were, um, you know, metal workers or uh, pottery makers or seamstress or uh, farmers. And very few people hold those jobs anymore. Most of those jobs don't even exist. And we're all just fine. We all have jobs. We all do something. And even though, like, I think the number one job that will probably go away will be like the long haul truck driver. Maybe that job will be one of the first ones phased out because of um, self-driving trucks that can do the long haul. And um, yeah. But those people may become uh, the people that, that do the short transportation hops because the short transportation hops will become more difficult and they'll, they'll still need a person for a period of time. Or maybe they're the people that uh, get jobs training the AIs or maybe they get jobs, you know, uh, doing maintenance on some of the vehicles or some of the electronics or take something out completely. Um, but as our generations age and people age out of work, there's less people to fill those jobs anyway. So it makes sense that um, we use technology to fill those gaps wherever necessary. Well, uh, you're leaving me with some hope, so that's good. <laughs> um, so, um, as we're coming close to the to the hour, is there anything else that um, that you want to leave the audience with, or tell them a way they can find out more about you and listen to your talk? I'm definitely going to link that up in the show notes so people can get to that as well. Sure thing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the 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 last thing you uh, I would say about about you know myself and and uh, how people or how I can I can help people in, in my own way which is um, you know I, I, I wasn't always in technology and uh, I, I'm a musician and uh, uh, you know the thought of uh, the thought of having one career or one aspect in which success relates is something that I would not want for people to grow up in especially in our age because of the fast, you know, pace of change happening all around us, we need to be more uh, polyvalent, uh, and we need to focus more on on creativity, on how to innovate in each and every uh, type of work we have, and um, to have as much or as many skills as we can master uh, and to stop thinking about you know career ladder because if, i mean just the the us uh, numbers you know in, in five years you know more than 70 percent of jobs will be big economy based uh, so you know it's very difficult to uh, to express this for people that have you know to have these expectations of what a career would make but it's my two cents um you need to be able to uh, uh, in envision yourself and imagine yourself in an environment where you need to be the you know to, to create to generate value but at the 
same time to be able to, um, you know, uh, negotiate, negotiate it, uh, sell it, and, uh, you know, explain it. And all those, those skills are much needed, especially when, you know, the more we go into the gig economy. Because um, when you hold a job, obviously, it's not, it's not much of a, a question because, you know, the person that hired you spent much money on your hiring box and training box. They don't want to change you. But once it's a gig economy, I can hire you today. If you don't do a good work, if you don't convince me, I can hire another guy or just stop the contact, right? So you need that kind of um, uh, adaptiveness and learn those kind of skills. Um, and, uh, you know, um, don't think of, yeah, for, for my first product, um, and, you know, yes, I sold licenses, but, you know, sometimes when you talk to some people, say, yeah, well, you didn't sell the company, um, you didn't exit with millions of dollars, um, you know, uh, that, that's called the failure. I would say it, that's that's something that I pivoted from because of you know reasons that I dislike to, and it's not about you know I, it's not that I don't like the word failure. Of course, uh, you know failure was in, as a word was invented for a certain for a certain need, but what I just need you know to to explain is uh, in some environments like Silicon Valley. Um, failing is celebrated, but for most of the world, failure means depression, failure means, you know, that you're not good enough, and failure means that you'll stop right there. Um, so I'm trying to kind of take out the, uh, the negativity of the word itself. Um, uh, I started, what, four companies and six products, um, and... There are some that I that I stopped, you know, willingly. There are some that uh, you know that didn't work out, but they didn't work out. It's not that I failed, and that's the that's the the, the kind of difference that I want to, to 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 help people with. And for you know uh, what I can help with, uh, obviously, um, is um, I heard you are on a you know on a path where you're you're not feeling up to the task or you have any questions around you know how to do or how to uh, be uh, you know the CEO that you need to think of the product and to market it um, in the technology space obviously um, or if you want to go into hardware uh, you know electronic hardware products is uh, my my second uh, startup is a software hardware products in the smart city environment. Um, so if there's any questions that you have about how to go about hardware, obviously uh, hit me up. Uh, John uh, will, you know, will put my, my social media links um, and my website uh, so, you know, you can reach out. Um, uh, you know, I'm here to help. And um, as for my specialties, Anything that's that's crazy, futuristic, and that has something to do with technology uh, is something that I venture into. And um, if, if you're on a continent that's pretty much been there, so uh, <laughs> uh, space spatial uh, distance is no issue. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, I think you're absolutely right what you said about um, failure and understanding that um, – there's something that can be learned from every experience and everything that you start and um, w whether it's, it's, it, there's different criteria of success. And some people say that this is a success or that's a success. I know when I had my first startup, I kept it for seven years and um, I did sell it to a competitor, but not for what most people would, would have thought it was worth. And for me, it wasn't about, so let's see how much money I can get out of this. It was like, I want to make sure that my customers are transitioned to someone that I trust and I can yeah. move on with my life and get, get do something different because I, I'm burned out. I'm not, not being a very good, uh, um, uh, supporter of my customers at this point. So I was ready to move on. And, and some people might say, well, that was a failure because you weren't 
doing this or that. But for me, that was success. I learned a lot about running a business and I can take those skills and those things that I've learned and move on and do something else. It's, it's uh, I can put more creative energy in, in, into it, things that I'm more passionate about today. And uh, I think it's been really good and I'll definitely link up your uh, your website and uh, social links in, uh, in the show notes. So check it out at geekleader.com and you'll see all that information there. And uh, I, I definitely really enjoyed it. It's a great talk. Ow!